different stages of your projects, like your pre-writing while you're drafting up the novel? How do I multitask different stages of my writing? Um, usually I'm only capable of writing new fiction on something, um, one thing at a time. However, revising just uses a different part of the brain. Um, I can sit down and say, okay, here is the project before me. Um, I'm very goal-oriented when I revise. I'll make a list of things that I need to change, and I will then organize them by how important they are, and I will read a chapter and try to fix those things in that chapter. And then I'll move to the next chapter. So, because it's so easily segmented, um, I can do that, just pick it up and go. With writing new fiction, I can't do that because the new fiction has to tie so much to what came before and I have to be you know, letting my subconscious work on what to do next that if I'm working on two books at once, they, um, I get passionate about one and get uh, bored with the other. Um, and so I try to keep myself writing new fiction on one thing at a time. Um, and pre-writing is just, you know, sporadic. It's like, ooh, this is a good idea. I go into my wiki and I work on a few pages in the wiki for a while. And then I move on to something else. It's more like the butterfly on the flower sort of thing for pre-writing for me. So they're just very different processes. Yes? Uh, do you envision any of your books or series as a movie or maybe an HBO series? <laughs> <laughs> do I envision any of um, my books as a movie or as a series? There are a lot of different projects in the works. Uh, for the Wheel of Time, Universal Pictures home, owns the rights. Um, and they are um, looking at developing feature films um, rather than a television show, though I have counseled that I think the television show would, would, would probably work a bit better. My, um, I would love to see Netflix pick it up and do like the whole season thing like they've started to do or things like that. Um, as for, um, for my own properties, um, my Legion, my novella has been optioned, um, and Mistborn is uh, constantly being bounced around to different places and, and we have that in the works. And then I have my, um, my teen book, um, Steelheart, which is coming in next year. All three of those are under option right now. Who knows what will happen with those. Um, their options, if you know Hollywood, they, every, one out of every 20 gets made. The Wheel of Time is not an option. It's a full buyout. Um, they're very serious about the Wheel of Time books. Um, all right, right here. What do you remember most fondly about your husband's work with And I'll just go ahead and repeat the question. So, okay. yeah. Um, the question is for Harriet. Harriet, what do you remember most fondly about um, Robert Jordan's writing and the process? Um, well, it was immensely fun uh, from the very beginning, even before The Wheel of Time. I, I, as an editor, had my own imprint briefly, and I gave him his first publishing contract for a historical novel called The Fallen Blood, which is now available from Tor, and it says in huge letters on the cover, Robert Jordan writing as Reagan O'Neill. <laughs> um, and that, I mean, it was fun all the way through. He'd been working on Conan. I mean, it was all fun. And what should I tell you? <laughs> well, when he began to give me the eye of the world, it was just terrific. And we, one of our two editorial serious disagreements, I said, Han, you've got all these cats in this story and you haven't given them colors. He said, they don't need colors. And I said, yes, they do. And he <laughs> said, so he wouldn't do it. So I went through and I made one green. And one was purple, and he really had smoke coming out of his ears. And he said, cats don't come in these colors. And I said, this is a fantasy novel. <laughs> so he went back and scratched out all my purples and greens and made them striped or black and white or whatever they ended up being. And that, that I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> Anyway, it was just a delight to work with and to be with. Any questions in this row right here? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I hear tell that you have a plan to use Allomancy to create a civilization with faster than light travel. Can you tell us anything at all about how that might work or what your thoughts are? Um, so the question is um, regarding uh, Allomancy and uh, faster than light travel. When I originally pissed 
pitched. <laughs> pitched the Mistborn series. Lots of sts in that. Um, when I told my editor about the Mistborn series, um, and my editor Moshe at Tor, I said, I've got this great idea, and it's, um, it's a trilogy of trilogies, past, present, and future. I'm going to do an epic fantasy trilogy, and then I'm going to do a modern day trilogy in which the epic fantasy has become the, um, the foundation of myth and religion. Um, and then I am going to do a science fiction trilogy in which the magic that's gone through all three um, becomes the means that they explore the universe. Um, and so I built into Allomancy um, the means by which they can use uh, faster than light travel. Um, there are hints, it has to do with the laws of conservation of energy. Um, about how it happened, but I, but there's tech level, I've, I've written The Alloy of Law, which is not one of those trilogies, it's just um, a, a side for fun thing. Um, I begin to dabble in it there, but they don't have a scientific level yet to understand what's going on, so they can't, I don't think the clues are there yet for you. Um, as you read the series, the clues will become um, more clear um, about how it will work. Thank you. And thank you for Alloy of Law, it was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, other questions? Anyone in this row here or over here? Yeah. Will there be a sequel to Alloy of Law or will you go on to the next set of trilogy? Um, I plan to do a sequel to Alloy of Law. Um, my, um, I had a lot of fun with it and um, very importantly it was, um, it was fairly quick to do for me, meaning it took like four months instead of 18 months, um, which a, a, a book in the Stormlight Archive takes between 12 and 18 months really to get, uh, to get good. Um, and I'm halfway through that process on one right now. Uh, so hopefully Stormlight 2 may be, because I started it back in, uh, uh, in June. Um, it might be out um, this fall. Okay. Um, if, um, if, if not, then it'll be the following spring. Cool. Um, Tor has been sticking stickers on Way of Kings saying coming fall 2013. So right. I, might, I, might be, uh, <laughs> I might already have missed the chance to, to push that back. But that's, um, that's what we're, we're doing. I'm about a third of the way through the actual writing, but I've done all of the pre-writing. Um, and so um, I'll have to finish it fairly soon and then get into the revisions, which will take about six months. So that, that'll determine when it comes out. Um, and, but because that's such an evolved series, I wanted to have something I could do with Miss Forn that was a little, I don't want to say simpler, but shorter. Um, I liked the, the kind of more just um, a detective novel set in the Miss Forn world. It allowed me to have some fun um, and to, do, to explore some things without having to get into something as expansive as the second trilogy, which will be um, thicker books that are more like the first ones. So, um, so yeah, I want to do some more of those. Uh, my goal is to write the second Mistborn trilogy after uh, Stormlight Book 5, because the Stormlight Archive is two sets of five. There's five books and then a break, and then five books, and I'll probably stop and do the second Mistborn trilogy in there. Cool. All right? Thanks. So that's, that's part of my, like, 10-year plan, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. All right, questions in the back. You'll have to belt them out toward me if you have them. Yes? What Go. happened to the Tinker song? What happened to the Tinker song? All right, let me mention, let me say this. We don't want to give spoilers um, for the last book, um, particularly not to the, to the whole crowd. So you can ask those when you come up through. So I'll talk to you about that one when you come up through because I worry, it's, what you're asking is not a spoiler, but my answer I think I can't give without giving spoilers for the last book. Um, how many here haven't finished the last book of the little time yet? See, there's plenty of people. Um, and so if you come up and ask me that when you're doing signings, I'll answer you then, okay? All right, any other questions that people have? Yes, right here. I just wanted to do, uh, have a mundane question. Uh -huh. So you're on a bit of a whirlwind tour here. Do you actually get any time to enjoy where you're staying? Do you even want to enjoy, or are you just like booking it to the next place? I do want to enjoy. Tour kind of likes me to book it, so we come to this agreement. I get, um, I get Sundays off. Um, and so I will be able to um, visit San Francisco a little bit. Um, and I also get one day off in Seattle because I'm going to go visit uh, Wizards of the Coast in Seattle. <laughs> so some of the magic designers want to give me a tour and things like that. So, so I, got, I got those those days off to go enjoy myself. So yes. It, tours are pretty, get pretty, uh, pretty grueling. Um, yeah. but, but um, at the same time, I spend all of my time sitting in my room writing stories. And so getting me out of the house is usually a good thing as well. So, so yeah. All right. Any other? Oh, right. Yes. Right back there. Go ahead. Oh, the, oh, have you considered making this board into a board game? 
Have I considered making this board into a board game? Um, I have had some interest. Uh, Crafty Games, who made the pen and paper RPG, they have the rights, and I've sent anyone who's asked regarding perhaps making one to them to discuss it with them. So, yes, way in the back. What do you think is the secret to being such a prolific writer? What is the secret to being such a prolific writer? Um, I'm pretty compulsive about writing. Um, I spend a lot of time every day doing it. Um, I don't actually write faster. Than, um, than anyone else. I really don't. Um, but I do spend a lot of time each day doing it. And the, the reason for that is twofold. When I started getting into this, I realized um, that there were people out there that were a lot more talented than me. And I, I still believe that. I, I, I see new authors and I read their books. I'm like, oh man, I wish, yeah, you, you. Um, but I felt I could work harder than them and practice to the point that my skill matched theirs, even if I didn't start in the same place. And so I spent, when I was trying to break in, um, I spent the first eight or nine years um, writing every day, um, and I, I tried to write uh, two books a year, a long one and a short one. I wrote 13 novels before I sold one. Um, Elantris was number six, um, and Miss Warren was number 14. Um, so, yeah, I spent a lot of time writing, and I got in a, in a habit. Um, one of the things I did to keep myself um, motivated was I let myself switch and jump projects pretty frequently um, because it's easy for me to spend too much time on one thing and then my momentum slows down. Um, not just It's not necessarily one book. I usually have good momentum for one book. Like For instance, um, I wrote Mistborn 1 and 2 straight through. If well, I would have tried book 3 right then, it, I would have just hit a wall, and I knew it. And so I let myself do something else. In that case, it was um, it was Alcatraz versus Evil Librarians. Um, and I let myself constantly do that. I usually, after I'd write a big, thick, epic book, which is what which is my true love, right? It's what I really is this one cutting out? Is this okay? No, it's good. Okay, it's my true love. This is what I love to do. But you know, I need to do stuff, other stuff. Even if you even if you love ice cream, you can't eat it all the time, right? Or or steak or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, she can. Okay. <laughs> Maybe ice cream's a bad example, but um, between Wheel of Time books, I let myself do other things, um, and that's where Alloy of Law came from. Was me stopping and saying I need to do something else for a while, and so that's part of it. And now that I've quote unquote made it, um, I, I feel like this. There, there are so many people who want to be writers that when I sit down to work. And if my I start drifting and you know solitaire opens or um, I end up on Reddit or something like that, I stop and I say, wait a minute. There are how many thousands of people who want to be doing what I'm doing right now, and I'm going to spend that time playing solitaire? Um, no, I'm not. And I close it and I go back to work because I feel I've been given this enormous opportunity. Um, I'm one of the most fortunate people in the world. I get to do what I love for a living and do something that a lot of people would love to be doing. And so I need to make good on it. I need to take this chance and I need to, I need to seize it and I need to, uh, I need to actually work. And so I do. Um, I find writing enjoyable. Um, I just like to do it. So that's, I don't know if that's much of a secret. It's just sit down. It's what uh, Howard, my friend, says, um, Big Hawk, uh, button chair, hands on keyboard. <laughs> All right, right here. Uh, can you give us any information on Hoyd, where he came from, <laughs> his purpose? Can I give you an intimate information on Hoyd? Um, all right, so it's story time. <laughs> um, I told you how I, I broke in, um, in that I spent all those years writing. And I also told you that my first love was epic fantasy, in particular the big series. Um, I have never been one that's had big series fatigue as a reader. I enjoy big series. Um, I understand that there are challenges with big series and there are certain things, certain um, problems that come associated with the big series, much in the way that, you know, it, they're just um, unavoidable issues that you have to deal with. Uh, but I love big series. And you don't grow up reading The Wheel of Time and loving The Wheel of Time, which I started in 1990. How many of you guys started this in 1990? Yep, there we are. Um, uh, I started with uh, when Great Hunt wasn't even out yet, um, and um, you don't grow up reading those and loving those without wanting to do your own. But at the same time, the business side of me, um, I always say that um, a writer is two persons. You are an artist, and then there's a business person. And the business person's job is to direct things when the writing isn't happening, right? Um, when you're actually writing, uh, the business person should be locked away. 
Um, but once you finish the book or before you're starting a book, the business person should be there to say, look, you've got these two projects that are equally exciting to you. This one looks like it's going to, um, to, to be more friendly towards selling. Maybe you should do that. And after you finish the book, the business person can come out and take that manuscript and run away cackling and then try to exploit it for whatever money they can, right? Um, because you want to be able to eat as a writer. But, and so the business person, when I was sitting down, was saying, look, you've got these great ideas. Um, it seems like it would make more sense to write the first book of each one so you can take those and try and sell them. Um, because if you have an editor who really likes this one book you send them and they say, this is pretty good, it's not for us because it's just the wrong mode. Maybe we already bought, you know, we bought a book that has talking cats that shoot, shoot lightning from their paws already. Um, <laughs> right, it's really good. We really can't do two of those in one year. What else do you have? If you send them book two, now the talking cat cats shoot fire from their paws, um, then they're going to be like, they're not going to want that. You would want to have something else you could send them. And so, um, Doing that, I wrote um, each of those 13, there was only one sequel uh, among them. So it was 12 original worlds and 12 first books and or standalone novels. Um, I felt this was very helpful for me also to practice my world building, um, come, forcing myself to create a new original magic system for every book, uh, forcing myself to, um, to, to explore new settings. It really got the generic settings out of my system early. Um, and things like that. And so I was doing this, but as I was working on them, um, by, by, um, I was like, man, I love the big epic. Um, and so on book six, which happened to be Elantris, I started telling a hidden epic. Um, I started a new sequence, and this, the book I wrote after Elantris, um, which was called Dragonsteel, I actually wrote as a prequel to Elantris, involving some of the same characters behind the scenes. You didn't know it, but they were. And then the book I wrote after, called White Sand, was a sequel to Elantris. Um, and then the book after, right after that, which was the, a version of Mistborn, um, was, um, was a sequel to that book. And there was a continuing character in each of them, hidden behind the scenes, doing things that was part of a greater epic. Um, this character is named Hoyd. Um, it, that's one of his many names. Um, and the idea was that eventually I could, for my own enjoyment, tie this all together. Um, well, then I sold Elantris. Um, and I, I'm like, well, okay, I sold Elantris and I was working on Mistborn. And I'm like, well, I can actually do this, right? I could do this intentionally from the get-go. Um, I've loved it when authors have done it, but it seemed like all the authors who have done things like this in the past, like Asimov, did it after the fact. They decided later in their career, oh, we're going to weave these together and make cool interactions between them. And I thought that was awesome. I had never seen it where it felt like they did it intentionally from the get-go. Um, and I said, well, I'm going to do this. And so I built a, a hidden epic behind the scenes. Um, Mistborn is the sequel to Elantra, so they just take place on different planets. Um, and there, there are characters that jump between the books um, that you will see interfering with one another and doing things behind the scenes. Now, one rule I put upon myself was that this could never come to the forefront of a book that wasn't, in, that wasn't specifically about it. That way you don't have to read them in order. Um, and you don't have to go to, um, into Way of Kings knowing everything that happened in all the other books. These are always going to be behind the scenes, um, tidbits, and, um, and Easter eggs until I write a series, which will happen, that involves all of that. And with that, I'll be upfront about it from the beginning and say, all right, guys, there's a lot of continuity on this one behind the scenes, just warning you. Um, so right now, you don't have to worry about that. Um, you, can, you can keep an eye out for the cameos. You can watch and see, you know, um, uh, there's a character from Elantris in Way of Kings, and there's a character from Mistborn in Way of Kings, um, characters you know. Um, and you can just watch for them, and they're hidden in there, and things like that, and it's lots of fun. And eventually you'll figure out what it, what's going on with all of this. Eventually. So that's what's going on with that, if you weren't aware. That's, that was, see, I told you story time. That went forever. Um, so, anyway, other questions? Um, let's do way... Continuity. The continuity is hard. Um, I, was, I was fortunate with Wheel of Time that I had Maria and Alan, who were Robert Jordan's assistants. Um, and Maria, in specific, is a continuity editor. That's her job. Um, and there are still things that we miss. Um, but uh, for continuity, I would do my best, but I'm not one of the, these, you know, these fans who has everything memorized. Right? I mean, I've read the books a number of times. I've read I like eight times when I, when I said yes. Um, I, I've been you know, one of those fans that did, did rereads periodically and things like that. Um, I love the series. Um, 
but I don't, you know, it will, I, I, I wasn't one to memorize lots of quotes and things like that. I never have been. Um, I've always said that, you know, there are bigger Wheel of Time fans than me out there, and there are better writers than me out there, but when you intersect good writers and Wheel of Time fans, there's like only one person in the middle, and that's why um, I ended up uh, uh, doing this. Um, but <laughs> but um, at the end of the day, I rely a lot on, um, on Maria to tell me, oh, Brandon, they already know this because they had a conversation about it in book seven. Um, or, oh, Brandon, this character actually Robert Jordan said died, even though he didn't talk about it uh, in the books, it was off screen. Or, oh, in an interview in 1994, he said this, Brandon, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> or even, you know, in book 11, you should know this, Brandon. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I rely on her a lot for that sort of stuff. And I'll, I'll tell one tale on him. She said, no, Brandon, you can't have that Asa die. She died in book 12. You killed her. <laughs> she did. She, she, that exact conversation happened. Yeah. Um, to try to manage continuity. It's so mammoth. Yeah. Okay, you, it, it isn't a one person job. Uh, to manage continuity for my own books because of how. I, I've seen how hard it is with uh, when you get to this uh, have this many books written. Um, I started. I have an assistant. And we've started up a wiki, which took all of my notes and transcribed them to the wiki over the course of the last three or four years uh, for the Cosmere, which is the greater world of all my books, um, and specifically for Way of Kings. And we're using the wiki, and we will write this is canon or this hasn't appeared yet in the books next to things that I say, so I know um, what I've said and what I haven't. <laughs> All right, let's just do two more questions, all right? We'll go right here and then right there. And then you guys can ask questions when you come through, too. It's okay. So. You mentioned Dragon's Game as an inspiration mm -hmm. to start writing fantasy, but what inspired you or who inspired you to start writing to begin with? Who inspired me to start writing to begin, to begin with? It was actually, I was, um, I was what we call a reluctant reader. When I was a uh, young teen, I didn't read. Um, I didn't like to read, uh, and people kept trying to give me books that they felt like I would love, and every one of them had like a boy in the wilderness with a dog, and then the dog dies, right? <laughs> I'm serious. And every time, and I, I got, I'm like, I don't want to read anymore. These are depressing, boring, dumb books. Um, and, um, and it wasn't until I was in eighth grade, and a teacher assigned me a book report, and she knew. Um, she's actually a professor at UC Irvine now. I've sent her a book since. Um, she knew that I was wiggling out of my book reports by like reading summaries, as kids do. And she said, all right, you have to read a book that I have on my shelf here, that I have read recently, so I can ask you questions that won't be in all of these summaries, and then I can know if you are actually reading or not. Um, so she forced me to pick one off of there, and that's where I found Dragon's Bay. Um, with that gorgeous Michael Whalen cover, it just grabbed me. It was a bigger book than I tried before, but it grabbed me for whatever reason. Um, I read this book. Um, I came running back to my teacher and said, people write books about dragons? <laughs> and she sent me to the card catalog, and the next book in line was Dragonflight by Anne McCaffrey in the card catalog. Um, yeah, and so I lucked out on grabbing that. I'm like, well, maybe this one will be as good. And that book was fantastic. So I read all the Anne McCaffrey, um, and the next one in the card catalog was Dragon Prince by Melanie Ron, which is why I, I list those books as part of, um, part of my inspiration. Those, um, th that's what got me into fantasy, and it, I started writing right about the time that Eye of the World came out, because it, it came out, it actually came out um, in spring of that year, but I didn't find it until fall, uh, right before Great Hunt came out. Um, and so, um, uh, that's when I found Eye of the World, and I started writing my own book shortly thereafter. All right, last question here, sir. Sure. Uh, this is for Harriet. Yes. I just wanted to thank you for introducing me to Brandon through Wheel of Time. And I was just wondering, so that's how I first heard his name. I was wondering when you first heard it. Um, when oh, wait, let's repeat the question. When did Harriet first hear my name? Um, that was the week after my husband's funeral. During that first week, a friend uh, who lives in Minneapolis was down in Charleston visiting for the funeral. And she loves fantasy and loves the net hangs out um, online much more than I ever have, or still do. And she put a printout in front of me and said, you need to read this. And it was the very beautiful eulogy that Brandon had written 
for Robert Jordan on his website. And I thought, gosh, that's really beautiful, and that's just the feeling for the books and for my husband's work that I would like to see carried on in the series. That's how that began. By contrast, another writer, who's a perfectly good writer, had had his agent call Robert Jordan's agent the morning after the funeral to express interest in the series. I never called him back. But there's nothing wrong with that writer. <laughs> I am going to go ahead and do a few things by way of announcement now, all right? And then we'll do a very short reading. Well, I say we. Harry will do a short reading. Um, we? Yeah. Let's begin the, the, the announcements first. Um, the first announcement is we, we've been doing um, a little, something a little different on this one. Um, we've been saying everyone goes to the line the first time with no personalizations. And then if you want a personalization, you wait until everyone's gone through the line, and then you come through a second time, and I will sign, we'll, we'll do three books the first time through. The second time we'll do as many as you want, and we'll personalize as many as you want. Um, one of the main reasons for doing it this way is, um, this lets Harriet leave a little bit earlier. Um, the signings get quite long. Um, it, these have been going about five hours each. Um, I like to play the geezer card. <laughs> so what we'll do is the first time through, this also lets us chat with you rather than when I have to do inscriptions, I'm just staring at the books the whole time. Um, so we'll, we'll get you through the first time, three books, no personalizations, I'm sorry, and then we'll all bid Harriet farewell. She'll head back to the hotel and relax. And I will stay around for as long as people want to get books signed. Um, this means that I can promise you that I will be here at least until 7, okay? So if you have a very, you know, a distant card or whatever, the count in the count, and you want to go grab Chinese or something, it's like the Lantern Festival or something. If you want to go out and browse, you want to look at whatever you want to do and come back, as long as you're here by 7, I promise I will still be here to sign your book. And I will wait until everybody that's here um, has their book signed, okay? So you don't have to worry about missing me. Um, are missing getting a signature um, uh, from me. You may miss Harriet's if you wait that long, but as long as you're back here, probably by six at the, um, at the earliest, Harriet will still be here. I don't think she'll be leaving before six. She probably won't be leaving until seven. I probably won't be going until like eight or nine, but we'll see um, <clears throat> just how long it takes. Um, so um, just by way of um, uh, my second announcement is I want to give a hearty um, a round of applause for Borderlands. It's a wonderful opportunity to check and see whether you wouldn't like to buy several other books. Yes. <laughs> um, Borderlands, um, I'm a, this store is very special to me. Um, the very first book tour I did for Elantris, um, when I was brand new with the first book out, we called a bunch of stores, and um, of the stores we called, they all said no. Um, I wasn't popular enough. They didn't want me, except for Alan. He said, yeah, we'll have him. Send him on in. <laughs> this, this is honestly true. I'm not even exaggerating. Uh, we went, turned down right and left, um, and it was Borderlands that said yes. Um, and so I drove out here from Utah, signed, and then drove home the next day. Um, oh, and it's like a 13-hour drive. In <laughs> um, and... Um, Borderlands has hosted me numerous times. Um, I've always appreciated them. I appreciate the independent booksellers. Um, these are the people that we need. Um, they're, they're in the trenches fighting to keep people reading and to keep people reading science fiction and fantasy. So, um, Alan and Jude, thank you guys very much for everything you do. By way of encouraging you um, to, to look for things, um, Harriet will sign all of the Wheel of Time books. Not all at once, you know, <laughs> um, but if of your, your three you want to bring up Eye of the World um, or something like that or, or, or whatnot and find some copies maybe in here, she will sign those. She worked on them from the beginning. Um, she discovered Robert Jordan and then she married him. Um, uh, something a lot of people don't know, she also um, edited the book Ender's Game. 
So, yes. Um, She will also sign um, Way of Kings. She did, um, she did a guest edit on the Way of Kings for me. Um, I will not sign other Wheel of Time books that I didn't work on. Um, and she will not sign books of mine that she didn't work on. Um, just so you know. Um, I do have um, something specifically I want to promote. Um, I don't know how many copies of The Emperor's Soul you guys have. Um, you've got a stack. Um, Emperor's Soul is actually a new book for me. Um, it's a novella. It is published by Tachyon, which is a local press of your um, out here um, from from San Francisco area. Um, it is a wonderful story. It is set in the Cosmere. Um, if you haven't ever tried any of my books, it's a good place to try because it's shorter, it's self-contained. Um, it is in the same world as Lantris, but it takes place with different characters and things. And I, I'm very very proud of it. Um, I think it's one of my finest works to date. And so I would heartily recommend that one to you. It's a nice, thin, um, somewhat cheaper book that you can pick up, um, and uh, they have lots of copies. Um, and Tachyon is a wonderful press, and so we, we appreciate them. Uh, so I want to give a special shout out to that. Um, if there are those of you here who um, have uh, disabilities, we would like you to, to invite you to be able to come to the front of the line, just go talk to Alan um, or Jude. Uh, same if you have um, really small children. We're talking like three-year-olds or younger. I have a three-year-old. I know how that is, so I like to try and, and give that little opportunity. Um, Otherwise, um, we're going to go ahead and go straight into a short reading. Does someone have a copy of the book? They want to us. He was first. He was first. Um, the short reading I've been doing, I've been, I've been suggesting. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, you've been doing. Um, um, I thought, what would be most special to me if I were going to a Wheel of Time signing, if I were just a, a reader? If Robert Jordan were still here, what would I want to hear? And I figured the thing I would want to hear would be the, the wind paragraph, the first paragraph of chapter one, which has been basically the same in every Wheel of Time um, book. And I figured this is the last time to hear a reading of that. And so I've just been asking Harry to read that one paragraph for you. And after that, we'll give the uh, microphone over to Alan, and he can tell you how to go about getting books signed. Chapter one. Eastward the wind blew. The wheel of time turns and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth.